I wanted one vacation without my stepson, but it made me realize I wasn't treating him as my own. Now we're working on becoming a real family. I'm a 38-year-old woman, and I've been married to my husband 39 for five years now. Together we have two little girls, one is five, and the other is two. I also have a 10-year-old son from a previous marriage. Unfortunately, my first husband passed away, so I'm the only parent my son has. Now, my husband has a nine-year-old son from his previous marriage, and here's where it gets tricky. His ex-wife is barely in the picture at all. They divorced when my stepson was only two years old, and she decided she wanted a fresh start. So, being the decent man that he is, my husband took full custody of their son. He originally wanted shared custody, but she wasn't interested. Since then, we've been raising my stepson with basically no involvement from his mom. Anyway, I recently got a pretty sweet bonus at work, and I started thinking about taking my family on vacation. But for once just this one time I want it to be a trip where it's just my family, you know, me, my husband, our two daughters, and my son. Every vacation we've ever taken has included my stepson, which of course makes sense he's part of the family. But I've always been the one taking care of him too, and just for once, I'd love a break from the responsibility of someone else's kid. Now, before anyone jumps on me, let me clarify I do not hate my stepson. He's a good kid, and we get along fine. But the truth is, he's not my child. And I don't think it's unreasonable to want to go on a family vacation that's just with the kids I gave birth to, especially considering that we've always done everything together in the past. So I brought this idea up to my husband, and to my surprise, he was totally fine with it. He understood where I was coming from. He gets that I'm not trying to push his son out of our lives, I just want to have one trip where I'm not in the role of stepmom. I suggested that my stepson stay with his mom for the week while we go. After all, it's not like I'm asking her to take him for months just one week. But if she refuses, then of course my stepson will come with us like he always does. It's not like I'm going to leave him stranded or something. But then, my mom found out about this plan, and she was not happy. She basically told me that I was being selfish, and that since my stepson's mom isn't involved in his life, I should be more involved to make up for it. I honestly think that's a completely unfair expectation. Just because his mom isn't around doesn't mean I should be bending over backwards all the time. She also said that I was being hypocritical for taking my own son on the trip, but not my stepson. But to me, that's completely different. My son has no other parent. I am all he has. My stepson still has his mom, even if she's not around much. So here's where I'm stuck. If my stepson's mom won't take him for that week, I'll definitely bring him with us. I'm not heartless. But is it really so bad to want just one vacation with my own kids? I've always included my stepson in everything. And this is just one time I'd like to do something different. The relevant comments someone named Asinine Adeline asked, If your math is right, you and your husband got married when your stepson was four, right? What kind of relationship does your stepson have with you versus his bio mom? I responded, yeah, he was four when we got married. As I said, he barely sees his bio mom. I'm not sure what point you're trying to make update, wow. So, this whole thing blew up way more than I expected. After reading through tons of comments calling me the a-hole, I realized I needed to take a step back and look at this from a different angle. I decided to show the post to my husband, and it led to a really long, emotional conversation that, frankly, I wasn't expecting, it turns out. My husband had never been completely comfortable with the way I've been handling things with my stepson, but he didn't know how to bring it up without causing tension between us. That was honestly hard for me to hear. He admitted that he felt like I was always a little distant with his son. And while he understood my reasons, it still hurt him to see me treat our girls and my son differently than his child. Hearing him say that made me realize something huge I'd never really thought of my stepson as part of my family. He's always been my husband's child and I saw myself as more of a caregiver than a parent to him. This wasn't something I did out of malice or neglect, but rather because of my own personal baggage. Let me explain. When I was a kid, my own father passed away before I even turned one, so I have no memory of him. My mom remarried when I was seven and I was thrilled because I finally had a father figure in my life again, but when I turned 11, my stepdad left and I never saw him again. That experience messed me up in ways I didn't fully understand until now. It taught me that step-parents weren't permanent and that relationships with them weren't real family bonds. Without realizing it, I had carried that belief into my relationship with my stepson. I thought as long as I was there, I was doing better than my ex-stepdad who left me and broke my heart. But I never truly embraced my stepson as my own and it took this whole situation to open my eyes to how wrong that was. After all the comments and after my husband opened up to me, I realized I needed help. So I booked an appointment with a therapist to work through my feelings. A few weeks into therapy, we also started family therapy, which has been life-changing for all of us. I even had a sit-down conversation with my stepson, where I explained my own issues and why I'd acted the way I did. He broke down crying, saying he had always been scared that I didn't like him, and honestly, that shattered me. 
I apologized and told him that wasn't true. I've just been a bad step parent because I never fully processed my own trauma. We had the first real heart to heart that we've ever had. Since that day, we've been spending more time together, just the two of us, and I'm working hard to change how I think about him. He's not just my husband's kid anymore, he's my son. Most of all, he always called me by my first name, but last Thanksgiving, he asked to start calling me mom. It made me so happy. I told him that I loved him and he said he loved me too. Since then, he always just calls me mom. A lot of people also talked about the ways my husband needed to improve, to be more assertive and protective of his children. He knows that. It's very easy to see the problems when they're presented to you all at once in a Reddit post, but when things happen day to day, it's a lot harder to realize how issues are building up. But he's working hard, like we both are, to try to make our family the happiest it can be. We both know we still have to keep working at this. I'm still in therapy and we're still having family therapy, but I'm grateful to work at it. I'm grateful to have all my children. It's very hard for me to write this, to think about the way things were before I started therapy. It makes me cry every time I think about it. But I want to thank you, Reddit. I wrote my original post just looking for validation from my own point of view, and I never thought the internet could change my life this way. But it has. I feel like for the first time we're truly a family. Community response Reddit. Commenter one, I couldn't have said it any better myself. The audacity of this woman is honestly astonishing. I've been with my boyfriend for about two and a half years and I literally could never even dream of trying to tell him that I didn't want one of his three children to come with us on vacation. His oldest 16M isn't even biologically his and he still takes him whenever he picks up his biological children from their mother's house. We would never, ever exclude him from any family fun trip we were taking. Pop, you're definitely a huge asshole in this situation, and it's weird that your own mother was the one to tell you this and not your husband. When you married your husband, his son became your stepson, just like your son became his step stepson. How would you feel if he wanted to exclude your son? You said yourself that your stepson's mother isn't a very attentive mother, and maybe that's not the same thing as having a deceased parent, but fuck lady. Have some goddamn empathy. Commenter 2, I am heartbroken for this child. He was already abandoned by his biological mother. Now the mother figure in his life doesn't want him either. Doesn't consider him family. How awful for this poor boy. I hope his dad realizes what he married and gets out of it so his son can be in a safe place where he is only surrounded by people that love him and want him. Commenter 3 dad is obviously just as much as an ah. He only begrudgingly accepted full custody and is totally on board with her plans. What kind of parent marries someone that treats their child like garbage and is okay with it? A garbage one. Commenter 4 for sure, dad is even more of an ah. This kid is going to go no contact with them as soon as he's an adult, and I bet they'll wonder why. I feel so bad for him. Commenter 3, yes, but if you'll notice, she said she was widowed. Apparently, this makes a giant difference on whether or not you can love the other person's child. You see her child is perfect and precious because they're. My boyfriend found out about my family's wealth and accused Maine of hiding it. Now he's gone digging into our private lives. So, I 17F have been dating this guy, Mike 16M, for about three months now. We're both juniors in high school, and everything's been great between us. We met through some mutual friends about eight months ago and hit it off pretty fast. He's funny, kind, and down to earth. Our relationship is amazing, but there's this big difference in our financial situations. My family is doing pretty well. We're not living in a mansion or anything, but we've got a nice house, take a vacation or two every year, and I don't really have to stress about money. I work just to stay busy. I've always been taught not to flaunt what we have, so I never really talk about money with people. Mike's family, on the other hand, struggles a bit more. He's mentioned how they sometimes have trouble paying bills and have to budget carefully. He's made a few comments about rich kids being spoiled or out of touch, so I kept quiet about my family's financial situation. I didn't want him to feel awkward or think differently of me. I love him regardless of his financial situation. He's seen my house and knows my parents run a business, but he doesn't know about the full extent of our finances. Things came to a head recently when Mike and I had dinner with my family and some cousins. During the dinner, one of my cousins mentioned our vacation home in the mountains a cabin we use for camping and hiking. Mike went quiet, and I could tell something was off. Later, when we were alone, he asked why I never told him my family had so much money. I tried to explain that I didn't think it was important and didn't want to make him uncomfortable. But he knew I was better off, just not how much. That's when he got upset and said something that caught me off guard. He mentioned how I could have helped him with things like gas money or his car repairs a few months ago. He said he wasn't asking for handouts but felt like I was hiding something from him when I could have made things easier. I told him I didn't want to make things awkward by offering money and that I didn't think it was my place to get involved in his finances, but now he says it feels like I wasn't being honest and that maybe I don't trust him enough to share that part of my life. 
Over the next few weeks, Mike started getting a bit invasive. He looked at my house on Zillow and was shocked by the value. He also started digging into my family members on social media to see what they do and how well off they are. I got really angry and told him I didn't appreciate him prying into my family's business and that my finances aren't his concern. Mike said he was just trying to understand my lifestyle but it felt like he was crossing a line. I never meant for this to be such a big deal. I was just trying to avoid making him feel uncomfortable or less than me. I thought my family's finances were irrelevant. Now I'm wondering if I should have been more open from the start. Yesterday I called Mike and asked if we could meet up for coffee to talk things over. He agreed. I explained that my family's finances are private and not my business to share. The money isn't even technically mine, it's my parents. That's why I didn't tell him. Mike didn't take it well. He asked how I could watch him struggle for months and not do anything. How I pretended to care while not understanding his situation. I told him I did care and have been supportive, tried to get him a job at my parents' store, gave him rides, offered gas money whenever he drove me, and supported him emotionally. I acknowledge that I don't understand his struggles because I haven't lived them, but I've done my best to be there for him. Mike dismissed all that, saying it wasn't the point. For him, it was about trust. He felt I kept something significant from him and wondered what else I was hiding. He said it wasn't about the money but about feeling unsupported. He felt there was now a huge gap between us and that he would never be equal to me. At that point, I got really frustrated. I told him he was asking for handouts and reminded him of our previous conversation where he said I could have helped with his car and gas I explained that the money he wanted wasn't even mine it's my family's. I couldn't just bail him out of his financial problems. I also emphasized how I supported him in other ways. I'm embarrassed to admit I lost my cool and almost started yelling. After I calmed down I told him I would never shame him for his struggles and that my family loves him regardless of his financial situation. We talked a bit more but eventually I told him I wanted to break up. It wasn't just about hiding my wealth but about him digging into my family's private lives. It was a breach of trust I couldn't overlook. Mike also said he wanted to break up because the financial gap was too big and our lives were too different. We ended the conversation and went our separate ways. Luckily he goes to a different school so I won't see him around much. I'm feeling a mix of sadness and relief. I do love him, and it was my first relationship so I wanted it to work. But I'm also relieved because I wasn't sure I could handle what Mike might do if I stayed. I didn't like him snooping into my family's lives. I'm wondering if I made a mistake ending things now, and it really sucks. Was I too harsh? I'm not even sure. I don't think I'll be dating anytime soon. I'm not eager to jump back into it. And just to clarify Mike's car is old and used, gifted to him by his uncle. It's about eight years old and heavily used. Mike doesn't know the full extent of my parents' assets. He just knew we were better off than he thought, which is why he started digging into my family's information. Even I don't know all the details of our finances my parents keep that private. The more I think about it, the more I believe that it wasn't just about the money or the differences in our financial situations. It was about how he handled those differences. I tried my best to support him emotionally and practically, even if I didn't provide financial help. I thought that would be enough. But he seemed to focus only on what he didn't have compared to what I did, rather than appreciating the support I was offering. I also keep going back to how he started digging into my family's private lives. I never thought I'd have to deal with someone invading my personal space like that, especially someone I cared about. It felt like a betrayal and a breach of privacy. I couldn't continue a relationship with someone who would act that way, no matter how much I cared for them. The decision to break up wasn't easy. It's my first relationship and I was really invested. But I knew I had to prioritize my own well-being and the respect I expect in a relationship. I needed to set boundaries, and Mike's actions pushed me to enforce them. It's painful to end things, especially when you still have feelings for someone, but sometimes it's necessary to move forward and protect yourself. Now that we've broken up, I'm trying to focus on myself and process everything. It's strange and a bit lonely to think about dating again after all this, especially since I'm still dealing with the aftermath of this relationship. I hope that in time I can look back and see this as a learning experience. I hope Mike grows from it too and learns how to handle difficult emotions and situations better in the future. For now I'm taking it one day at a time and trying not to rush into anything. I'm still processing my emotions and figuring out what I want moving forward. It's a tough situation, and while I don't hate Mike, I do think we were too different in the end. I wish him well and hope he finds the happiness and stability he's looking for. Commenter 1 NTAIC Red Flags You are right to keep your family's finances private. You know what's theirs is theirs. An eight-year-old car is basically brand new, especially if it's made in 2016. That's just ridiculous. You absolutely made the right move. You'll process this. It'll hurt. It'll suck. But you will get stronger and wiser because of all this. Awesome you stuck to your convictions and what you believed and good on you for understanding your worth. Good luck.
Commenter 2 My car is 14 years old and runs fine unless you live in the salt mines 8 is nothing. Commenter 3 So true. I drive a 2010 Toyota Camry and will do so until it finally dies. 1. Because I like not having a car payment and 2. It still looks and drives great even having 145,000 miles on it. Commenter 4 Op I hate to break it to you, but this relationship was done the moment he asked for a handout and said he wasn't asking for a handout. This is code for give me money but I don't have to thank you because it's not a handout. Being turned into your boyfriend's piggy bank is not healthy. I wish you the best of luck for future relationships. This was your first relationship and whatever mistakes you made are well within the normal range. Doing things wrong is normal, and the first one hurts the most when it fails and it usually fails. It's also pretty normal to find out the first guy you are date is not compatible with you. Thanks for watching till the end, wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share, I'd love to hear from you. My son uninvited me from his wedding to please his fiancé's high society family, so I canceled their dream venue. I'm 53F, a widow, and I've been teaching economics at the local community college for longer than I care to admit. Life's been, well, it's been a journey. Anyway, I've raised Ivan on my own since day one. It hasn't always been easy, any single parent will tell you that. But we managed. I scraped and saved, worked extra hours, and did what I had to do to make sure he had a good life. And you know what? I thought I did a pretty decent job. Ivan grew up to be smart, kind, and hardworking. He landed a good job at a tech startup after college, and I couldn't have been prouder. Then, about two years ago, Ivan started dating this girl, Ellen. Now, don't get me wrong, Ellen's a nice enough girl, but she comes from money, like serious money. Her parents own half the high-rises downtown, and let's just say their idea of a casual weekend is my idea of a luxury vacation. At first, I was happy for Ivan. He seemed smitten, and Ellen was polite enough when we met. But then things started changing. Ivan began making comments about our house, my clothes, even the way I speak. Suddenly, the home I'd worked so hard to make for us wasn't good enough. The furniture I'd saved for years to buy was embarrassing. The dress I wore to their engagement party was not up to standards. It hurt. God, it hurt so much. But I tried to brush it off. I told myself Ivan was just nervous about fitting in with Ellen's family that he'd come around eventually. But then, well, that's where this whole mess really starts. And why I'm here, pouring my heart out to a bunch of strangers on the internet, wondering if I'm the asshole in this situation. So, where was I? Right? Ellen? That's my son's fiancé. I changed the names, by the way. Ellen swept into our lives like a hurricane in designer heels. The first time I met her, she showed up at our house in a car that probably cost more than my annual salary. I remember thinking, well, this should be interesting. Now, I'm not one to judge people by their clothes or cars, but Ellen? Let's just say subtlety isn't her strong suit. She walked into our living room, looked around with this weird mixture of curiosity and pity, and said, oh, how quaint. I nearly choked on my coffee. But you know what? I tried. I really did. I made her favorite tea, asked about her family, her job, her hobbies. And she was polite enough, I suppose. But there was always this underlying tension, like she was afraid to sit on our couch in case some of our middle-classness might rub off on her designer dress. After they left, I thought that was that. Maybe not the best first impression, but we could work on it. Ha, huh. if only I knew. That night, Ivan called me. He was all worked up, talking a mile a minute about how we needed to upgrade our house. Apparently, my cozy little home that I'd poured my heart and soul into for the past two decades was an embarrassment. Mom, he said, you should see Ellen's parents' place. It's like something out of a magazine. Can't we at least get some new furniture? Maybe repaint the walls? Something to make it look less? You know less what, Ivan? Less like the home where you grew up? Less like the place where we celebrated your birthdays? where I nursed you through chicken pox and first heartbreaks I was furious. And hurt. God, I was so hurt. I told him, probably a bit too sharply, that I liked my house just fine, that some of that furniture had been picked out by his father, and I wasn't about to throw it out just to impress his new girlfriend. We had a huge fight that night. Our first real blowout in years. After that, Ivan rarely brought Ellen around. I only saw her a handful of times over the next year, usually at restaurants or cafes, always on her turf, never on mine, and each time I felt more and more like I was auditioning for a role in my son's life rather than just being his mom. Then came the engagement party. Oh boy, that was a night and a half. Ellen's parents rented out this swanky rooftop bar downtown, the kind of place where they have a dress code and the menu doesn't list prices. I spent weeks agonizing over what to wear, finally settling on a navy blue dress I'd bought for a colleague's wedding a few years back. I thought I looked pretty good, all things considered. But the moment I walked in, I knew I'd missed the mark. Everyone else looked like they'd stepped off a red carpet. Designer dresses, custom suits, jewelry that probably cost more than my car. 
And there I was, in my off-the-rack dress and costume jewelry, feeling like a fish out of water. Ivan took one look at me and his face just fell. He pulled me aside before I could even say hello to Ellen and hissed, Mom, couldn't you have made more of an effort? This is important. I was stunned. I did make an effort, Ivan, I whispered back. This is the nicest dress I own. He just shook his head, looking pained. Maybe we can find you something else to wear for the wedding, he muttered, before plastering on a smile and rejoining the party. I spent the rest of the night in a daze, nursing a glass of champagne that cost more than my weekly grocery budget, watching my son schmooze with Ellen's family and friends. He looked so at ease in this world of wealth and luxury, and for the first time I felt like I was looking at a stranger. As I drove home that night, I couldn't shake this sinking feeling in my gut. Something had shifted between Ivan and me, and I didn't know how to fix it. But that's where the whole wedding venue drama comes in, and honestly I need another cup of coffee before I get into all that. This mom is emotionally drained, and we're not even at the worst part yet. So, about a month ago, Ivan calls me up out of the blue. He's all stressed out, talking about how they're having trouble finding the perfect wedding venue. Apparently Ellen had her heart set on this gorgeous old estate just outside the city. Problem was, the owners weren't keen on renting it out for events anymore. Something about rowdy guests and property damage. Now, here's where I made my first mistake. I recognized the name of the estate owner, let's call him Mr. Cooper. Turns out he was an old college buddy of mine. We'd lost touch over the years, but I figured it was worth a shot to reach out and see if I could help. I spent the next week calling in every favor I could think of, reminiscing about old times with Mr. Cooper and promising up and down that my son's wedding would be different. No property damage, no rowdy guests, just a nice, classy affair. Eventually, he agreed to rent out the estate. I didn't tell Ivan it was me who sorted it out. I wanted it to be a surprise, you know, a wedding gift from his old mom. I figured he'd be touched when he found out after the big day. About a week after I'd secured the venue, Ivan shows up at my door. He looks, I don't know, uncomfortable nervous. I invite him in, offer him some coffee, but he just stands there in the hallway, shifting from foot to foot. And then he drops the bomb. He tells me, in this weirdly formal voice, that he and Ellen have been talking, and they think it would be best if I didn't attend the wedding. Apparently I wouldn't fit in with their crowd. Ellen's family was concerned that my presence might make some of their high society guests uncomfortable. I just, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, my own son uninviting me from his wedding. I must have looked like I'd been slapped because Ivan started backpedaling, saying how they'd have a small family ceremony later, just for me. As if that made it any better, I started crying. I'm not proud of it, but the tears just came. And you know what Ivan did? He got frustrated, started telling me I was being selfish, that I should understand how important this was for his future, that if I really loved him, I'd step aside gracefully. I was devastated, heartbroken. But more than that, I was angry, furious even. This boy that I'd raised, sacrificed everything for, was tossing me aside like yesterday's garbage, because I wasn't high class enough for his new family. So I did something I'm not proud of, something that, looking back, might have been an overreaction. But in that moment, hurt and angry as I was, it felt like the only thing I could do. I called Mr. Cooper, told him everything, about how my son had uninvited me from the wedding, about how his new family was ashamed of me. Mr. Cooper was appalled, said he couldn't, in good conscience, host a wedding for someone who'd treat their mother that way. The next day, Ivan got a call. The estate was no longer available for his wedding, no explanation given, just a polite cancellation and a refund of his deposit. I know, I know it was a petty move, but I was hurting so bad and it felt like the only way I could strike back at the son who seemed to have forgotten everything I'd done for him. Of course, it didn't take long for Ivan to put two and two together. He came storming over to my house, all red-faced and yelling about how I'd ruined everything, how Ellen was in tears, how her parents were furious, how all their fancy invitations were useless now. He demanded I fix it, begged me to call Mr. Cooper back to make it right, but I just couldn't. The damage was done, both to their wedding plans and to our relationship. I told Ivan that maybe this was a sign, that if he was so ashamed of his own mother that he'd uninvite her from his wedding, maybe he wasn't ready to get married at all. My best friend's wedding was supposed to be a celebration, but she set me up to look like the villain. Now I've lost everyone I care about. I'm 26, female, and I've been tight with my bestie Bella since we were five. Our families were super close, and we were basically inseparable. I went away for college, but Bella and I kept in touch like no biggie. She'd come visit me all the time, and we had the best times. Anyway, while I was in college, I met this guy, Barat. He was smart, good-looking basically the whole package. We hooked up a few times after study sessions, but it was just a friends with benefits thing. We stayed cool, but we didn't really keep in touch after that. Bella and Barat met at a party I threw and it was like instant fireworks for Bella. She was all over him, and I was totally cool with it. I even told her she had my blessing. A few months later, they were officially a thing, and Bella was over the moon. I was happy for her. 
After graduation, I moved six hours away for work. Bella and Barat stayed in my hometown. I tried to visit when I could, but life got crazy, so I mostly saw them around the holidays. Last Christmas, Barat proposed to Bella at a party my family hosted. It was super sweet, and everyone was pumped. Fast forward, Bella was all about wedding planning. We had a blast brainstorming ideas. I figured she'd ask me to be her maid of honor, but no. She started screening my calls. I got a save the date card, but no word about being in the wedding. I called her and she said she didn't think I should be in it because I lived too far and it'd be a hassle. Her cousin got the maid of honor spot instead. I was pretty hurt. I thought I was her closest friend. I told her I could make it work, even if it meant flying in for all the events. She was like, A, hey, whatever then she asked if I was bringing someone to the wedding, which was weird because I just had a bad breakup. I said I'd probably come alone. She told me she'd keep my plus one open and encouraged me to find a date so I wouldn't be lonely. I thought that was nice of her but reassured her I'd be fine. As the wedding neared, Bella still wasn't really in touch. I saw on social media that she had an engagement party I wasn't invited to. It stung, but I figured we were drifting apart. About six weeks before the wedding, Bella called and asked if I could step in as a last-minute bridesmaid since one dropped out. I was thrilled and agreed right away. She told me the bridal party would be in white, and she and Barrett would be in black. I thought it was a quirky touch. Totally Bella. She even approved a white slip dress I had and tagged it with a thumbs up. On the wedding day, I showed up early, in sweats with my dress in a bag. Everything seemed fine. We were having fun getting ready with champagne, but then Bella told everyone to get dressed for photos. I went to change and tweak my makeup. When I came out, all the other bridesmaids were in blue dresses, and I was the only one in white. My stomach dropped. Bella was in a bathrobe and looked at me like I was the worst. Her cousin came over, yelling at me about being jealous, in love with Barat, and making the day about me. I was totally blindsided and couldn't even defend myself. Bella said it was time for me to leave. I was heartbroken and bolted, leaving everything behind. My phone blew up with messages accusing me of being bitter and jealous. Even my mom texted, saying she was disappointed and we'd talk when they got home. I ended up getting drunk to cope. When my parents got back, the conversation was a mess. My mom didn't believe me at first, but when I showed her the text where Bella approved my dress, she finally got it. Turns out, Bella had been spreading lies about me being unstable and in love with Barat. She'd convinced everyone I was crazy and made up stories about me. My mom was horrified when she saw the truth, and she called my dad to explain. Now, my reputation's in tatters. A few people believe me, like my parents and one of the other bridesmaids, but most think I'm the bad guy. My life feels like a wreck and I don't know how to fix it. I'm not sure if I'm the asshole here, but I really need some outside perspective. So, people have been wondering why my mom didn't reach out or confront me. It's because I'm an apostate. I left the religion my parents raised me in last year. Bella, my ex's sister, is still deep into it, so she's got a lot more clout in their eyes. On top of that, my political views are different too. From my parents' perspective, I'm a sinner who's capable of anything because I turned my back on biblical principles. The whole community probably thinks the same about me. Even with all this, I still tried to keep some relationship with my parents. I'm an only child, and they're my only family. But it was tough. For example, I didn't share much about my breakup because I knew it just confirmed their worst fears about me. It's also why I haven't been home in the past year. I thought the wedding drama would push my relationship with my parents even further apart. But surprisingly, it's done the opposite. My parents' strong opinions seemed more about how my leaving the church would reflect on them rather than about me personally. Now that the community has turned against me and the worst has happened, they've rallied around me. So, in a weird way, this awful event has been a blessing. My parents have chosen to stand by me, and that's made things feel a lot better. We had a great holiday together, and the awkwardness from the past year seems to have faded. After the wedding mess, I did what people suggested and sent out a screen recording of my texts with Bella. It showed everything I'd been saying to counter her claims that I was unstable. I explained my side, and it ended up splitting people into three groups. First, my high school friends, most of them are religious and heavily influenced by Bella. None of them took my side, except for one bridesmaid who had already reached out to me. Then there are my college friends who are closer to me. None of them had heard Bella's side, so they accepted the evidence right away. A few even told me they never really liked Bella and that she'd been badmouthing me behind my back. This was news to me but a relief, because these are the relationships I wanted to keep. The college friends closer to Barrett didn't really care. They're classic due to bros who avoid drama, so I wasn't surprised they weren't diving into the details. No hostility from them, but no support either. I can deal with that. As for Bella's nuclear and extended family, I've pretty much given up on them. When I was back for Christmas, I tried to visit Bella's parents, who were like family to me too. They didn't even open the door. I left a letter in their mailbox, but it was ignored. Overall, things have settled into a new normal. I've been focusing on my life, my work, and trying to move forward. I went home for the holidays and just hung out with my parents. Life was okay. 
Then, on January 1st, I logged into an old email account I hadn't used in a while to reset a password. While cleaning up my digital life, I found an email from my ex with the subject line I win seeing that was like getting hit by a ton of bricks. It's still tough to talk about. Matthew, my ex, was great at first. But things turned dark after our first year together. He got super controlling dictating what I wore, ate, who I talked to, and what I posted on social media. He tore me down bit by bit. When I found out he was cheating, that was my wake-up call, and I got out. Breaking up with him was a nightmare. He refused to let me go, especially since we were living together. Things got worse, he became a full-on stalker. He put tracking software on my phone, bugged my car, and even had people at my job reporting back to him. It was like living in a nightmare. I couldn't hide anywhere. He even held my dog hostage. The police were useless because he was never physically violent and was careful not to leave written threats. I was stuck in a hellish loop of fear, constantly worried he'd show up again. I changed everything my job, phone number, address, email, and made all my social media profiles private. But there was one place I forgot to block him. I didn't think about the old email account, and that's where he sent his I win email the day after the wedding. He bragged about how he'd become close with Bella after we broke up. He called himself the architect of my demise and said he'd fueled Bella's paranoia about me and Barrett. Leading them to plan my punishment, he said losing everyone important in my life was what I deserved. And then, in a twisted move, he suggested we get back together or else face more unfortunate things, yeah? He's a delusional jerk. Reading that email was like a freight train hitting me. I fell apart for a few days. But my mom helped me get through it. She reminded me that things would be okay and that I'm stronger than I know. I was worried about what I'd do next, but talking with her helped me realize that I'm not powerless. I have some closure now, even though it doesn't fix everything. I'm doing my best to move forward. I've got support from my family, and I'm slowly rebuilding my life. I'll never understand why people act the way they do, but I'm focusing on staying strong and positive. My brother's wife had an affair with their neighbor and threatened Maine to keep quiet. I exposed her with a shocking birthday gift. I'm 27 and my older brother, David, who's 33, is married to Suzanne, 35. They've been together for about four years now and tied the knot last year. Their love story is the classic work buddies turned lovers kind of deal. David just landed an awesome new job at another company, so they're in town for Thanksgiving at our parents' place. Since I had taken a couple of extra days off work, I was the first to arrive. I wanted to spend some extra time with mom and dad. David and Suzanne showed up later, and while everyone greeted them warmly, I noticed David wasn't his usual self. He looked exhausted with dark circles under his eyes and barely managed to smile. It was kind of concerning, but I didn't want to bring it up in front of everyone. I asked Suzanne if something was wrong with him, and she just shrugged it off saying they had a long trip. I was a bit worried, but decided to put it aside. I spent some time with my 11-year-old nephew, Daniel, who's growing up so fast. He was all excited about a new game he wanted to show me on his tablet. Turns out, Suzanne had given Daniel her old tablet when she got a new one from work. I was kind of surprised Daniel had his own tablet and asked him about it. We played the game together, and it was a nice distraction from the weird vibe with David. Later, Suzanne came up to take the tablet from Daniel because it was bedtime. I asked if I could borrow it to keep playing since mine was acting up. Suzanne hesitated but handed it over, telling me to make sure Daniel got it back in the morning. While I was playing, a text notification popped up. It was from someone named Chad, saying, Missing you already, I froze. Why was my nephew's tablet getting these kinds of texts? I quickly realized Suzanne's iCloud was still synced with the tablet, so all her messages were showing up there. I opened the messages app and was shocked. There were intimate conversations between Suzanne and Chad, my brother's neighbor. They'd been chatting about how Suzanne didn't love David anymore and how Chad was giving her the attention David wasn't. Their texts were filled with details about their meetings and graphic content. I felt sick to my stomach. I took screenshots of everything as evidence and then unsensed and wiped the tablet clean, not wanting Daniel to stumble across this. I barely slept that night, turning it over in my mind. At 3 a.m., I saw David downstairs watching TV. I brought him some ice cream and sat with him. We talked, and he mentioned he was stressed from work, but there was more going on. I decided to address it. I asked him if everything was okay between him and Suzanne. He admitted they were distant because he was working two jobs to keep up with their lifestyle. I wanted to tell him what I had found out, but I wasn't sure how he'd react, especially with him already struggling. I figured I'd give Suzanne a chance to come clean before I told him. Over the next few days, Suzanne kept up a facade. She didn't confess anything and seemed to be in touch with Chad frequently, which made me even more determined to act. Her birthday was coming up, so I decided it was the time to expose her if she didn't fess up. On her birthday, Suzanne was super cheerful, soaking up all the attention during the celebration. When it was time to open presents, she eagerly unwrapped a package from me. Inside was a photo album. As she flipped through it, she saw pictures of her from college, but then it hit her there was an a four-size photo of her and Chad and screenshots of their messages. 
The room went silent as David, mom, and dad took in the contents. Suzanne tried to close the album, but David grabbed it and went through the pages. My parents were visibly shocked. Dad asked what was going on, and I explained how I found out through Daniel's tablet and confronted Suzanne, who had threatened me and refused to confess. David, now holding Suzanne's phone, went through her texts and found more evidence. He looked devastated. Suzanne tried to make excuses, but Dad told her to leave our house. It was a relief to see Suzanne finally face the consequences of her actions. Since then, David hasn't flown back with Suzanne. He's keeping his distance from her, and Daniel is staying with us. My parents support what I did, but my grandmother later told me she disapproved, saying I shouldn't have disrupted David's marriage. I respect my grandmother a lot, and her opinion has me questioning if I did the right thing. But I stand by my decision to protect my brother and nephew from Suzanne's deceit. I would like to clarify yet again that I would have never done this had Suzanne decided to talk to my brother on her own. This is why I confronted her before exposing the truth on her birthday. I wish she would have been a better person and broke the news to him on her own, instead of trying to threaten me. As for my brother, he and I sat down to discuss everything in more detail. It was heartbreaking to see my brother break down in front of me, while telling me that he had no idea that his wife had been doing all this behind his back. He kept questioning if this had happened because he couldn't give her enough attention due to his two jobs. My heart went out to my brother, knowing how hard he worked to provide for his family. I told him that Suzanne's actions had nothing to do with him. He had always been an exemplary husband and father, and if Suzanne couldn't appreciate that, then she didn't deserve to be with him. Despite my attempts to console him, my brother remains deeply affected by the situation, repeatedly going through the photo album containing all of Suzanne's messages with Chad. I am uncertain when he plans to talk to Suzanne about it. I have decided to take a few more days off from work and consider working from my parents' place to support my brother and help take care of my nephew during this challenging time. For the last couple of days, Suzanne has been sending me messages that have slowly turned into more and more crazy threats. She continues to blame me for revealing her secret to my brother and the rest of the family without acknowledging any responsibility for cheating on my brother in the first place. At first, I brushed it off because it was understandable why she was angry at me, but over time, her messages have become more and more graphic where she keeps threatening to physically harm me for what I have done to her. Her messages became so vile that I was forced to show them to my parents today. My mom and dad were immediately upset and furious to read her threats. They urged me to show these messages to my brother. I hesitated, knowing he was already dealing with a lot and feeling down about the whole situation. However, when he saw what Suzanne had been sending me, he immediately switched to protective older brother mode. He assured me that he would handle the situation and told me to block her right away. He promised that she wouldn't bother me again and made it clear that he would take care of dealing with her behavior. It's been a priority for me to spend extra time with my nephew lately. With my brother and him set to fly back home in a couple of days, I want to make the most of our time together. Even though my nephew senses that something is off because Suzanne isn't around, being a child, he easily gets absorbed in his games and toys. For the sake of my adorable nephew, I hope everything turns out okay. Following my brother's advice, I have blocked Suzanne, so hopefully she won't be able to reach out to me anymore with her threats. I am focused on creating a more positive and comforting environment for my nephew during these uncertain times. After my brother and nephew flew back home, he confronted Suzanne about the situation. However, she continued to deny everything, despite the clear evidence we had. Frustrated and determined to get the truth, my brother decided to have a direct conversation with Chad. In this conversation, Chad confessed to everything. Chad revealed that Suzanne had expressed her love for him, and he reciprocated those feelings. According to Chad, he had no reason to continue hiding their affair. To my brother's shock, Chad disclosed that they had been involved romantically for over a year. This new revelation led to a heated and intense confrontation between David and Suzanne. Later, when my brother told us about his conversation with Chad, we were heartbroken for him as well. My dad urged my brother that it was high time for him to decide their marriage. My mother agreed and told my brother that no matter what he decided, we would all stand by him. I also reminded him that he should keep my nephew's best interest at heart because it was unhealthy for a child to be exposed to such toxicity. Two months later, David made the difficult decision to file for separation from Suzanne. The continuous fights had taken a toll on their relationship, and he realized there was nothing left to salvage. Unable to forgive Suzanne for her actions, and with Suzanne unwilling to confront her mistakes, it became clear that the best course of action was to part ways. As the legal process is still ongoing, Suzanne has been compelled to move out of David's home. The weight of her actions bore heavy consequences, and she faced the reality of losing her marriage. Despite the challenges, my family has remained a united front for David and my nephew. The emotional toll on David is visible, but he continues to exhibit strength and resilience, determined to provide a stable environment for his child, Daniel. Reflecting on the entire experience, I firmly believe that revealing Suzanne's affair was necessary for my brother's well-being and the protection of my nephew. The truth brought clarity and allowed my brother to realize that he was being mistreated.
Throughout this ordeal, my family has grown closer and our support for one another has strengthened. I am grateful that we were able to face this difficult situation together and help David navigate this challenging chapter in his life. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you. I thought I found love, but my boyfriend turned out to be emotionally abusive. Now I'm struggling to heal and move on. Me 19F and Alex 20M met online and clicked right away. We got super close over the next few months, sharing secrets and childhood stories we never told anyone else. Even though we both lived with our parents and went to different schools, we managed to hang out a bunch just talking and walking around. After a while, Alex started flirting with me. He'd send messages like, love you, I'm falling for you, and I think you're my soulmate, but I've been through stuff before, so I didn't take it too seriously at first. I joked around to keep things light, trying not to get too attached too fast. I'm a hopeless romantic and I wanted to take my time falling for him, not rush into something that might break my heart. The day after Christmas, he came over to exchange gifts. He met my parents unexpectedly, but they liked him. He gave me this heart-shaped pillow and said he wanted me to feel close to him, even when we couldn't be together. Later, we ended up making out and losing our cards to each other. New Year's came around and we couldn't meet up because of family stuff. But he showed up at my place for like five minutes right before midnight, which was so sweet. He asked for a break to focus on schoolwork, and we stopped talking for a week. During the break, he sent Snapchats hinting that he missed me, saying stuff like I miss you in French and doing things I liked. When we started talking again, he admitted those snaps were for me and said he missed me during the break. I told a friend that I couldn't just be buddies with someone I was in love with it be too painful if they didn't feel the same way. A few days later, he brought it up, and I explained that unrequited love just hurts too much for me. He seemed to get it, and we carried on as usual. During one of our usual sunset walks, he mentioned that we were together now. In our culture, we don't do the whole will you be my girlfriend boyfriend thing, we just start spending time together and acknowledge that we're a couple. His parents went away for the weekend and he invited me over for the night. This was huge since strict parental rules had always kept us from having sleepovers. He noticed I was acting a bit off I didn't even realize it and later we went to bed. I couldn't sleep, so when he dozed off, I slipped out to the couch. A minute later, he came looking for me. We ended up talking and crying together until 3 a.m. Then we went back to bed and finally fell asleep. The next day, he made pancakes and I left before his parents got back. Alex, he's a big gamer and super active on Discord, had this supportive online crew. I became friends with his Discord buddies and we'd have group video calls. In early May, he turned 18, got his driver's license, and inherited his sister's car. I made him a heartfelt birthday video with his Discord friends, which actually brought him to tears. He threw a party, and I brought my best friend along because I'm kinda shy. Some comments about Alex made me uncomfortable, but I brushed them off as harmless teen talk. We didn't spend much time together at the party, but I was cool with it. He drove me home afterward. On my 17th birthday, he gave me a song he wrote himself it was super touching, and I still cherish it. I'm not big on celebrating my birthday long story, childhood stuff, so I just had a small family thing. My family has a summer home in this peaceful village, about two hours from the city, surrounded by woods. In June 2021, we went there, and I worked at the local cafe as a server, like I had in previous summers. While we were there, Alex was dealing with ongoing family drama with his dad. They fought a lot. But things had gotten worse, and he was feeling really down. I'd always been there to cheer him up during tough times. One night, he decided to confront his dad to try and sort things out. I supported him before heading to bed. The next morning, my mom woke me up, saying Alex was urgently trying to reach us. Turns out, he decided to run away and was waiting for Jake, a mutual friend, to drive him to our summer house. I didn't fully grasp what was going on, but I backed his decision. The next day, after some initial worries, Alex joined my mom on errands and waited for me to finish work before we all went home together. My dad's a traditional, old-school guy who usually puts my sister's husband to work when he's around. Worried about Alex being in a new place and dealing with family issues, I asked my dad not to give him any chores. Every night, Alex would call his older sister to talk about the family problems. I'd leave the room to give him privacy. One night, after one of these calls, I heard him crying. I went in to offer support, sitting on the bed to let him know I was there. He hugged me tightly, cried, and thanked me for being there. Another time, he came into the bathroom while I was showering, teary-eyed, to tell me his mom had sent a heartbreaking email begging to fix the family issues. It really got to him because he cares about her a lot. Alex loved our summer house and the way my family interacted were pretty tight-knit. After a week, he agreed to meet his mom in a nearby town to try and work things out. Me, my dad, and Alex went to meet her. We packed up his things and said our goodbyes. But shortly after we left, Alex called, upset, asking to come back with us. We returned to his place, he explained what happened, and decided to come back to the summer house. My family and I supported him through it all. He stayed a few more days, and I made sure he felt comfortable and safe. My dad asked Alex to help with chopping wood, and Alex actually enjoyed it. He appreciated my dad's patient guidance and nice change from his own dad, who had a quick temper. My dad enjoyed working with him too, praising his skills. They even shot a hunting gun together. Alex played ball with my little brother and joined us for Monopoly nights. After a few days, his older brother came to pick him up and they managed to resolve some of the family issues. In early August, I went with Alex to his motocross race and spent time with his parents for the first time. We stayed at his family's apartment before and after the race. Later, he drove us back to the city and my family returned the next day. On August 8th, we had plans to go out, but Alex decided last minute to stay in and watch a movie. As time went by, I got super hungry, which led to our first fight. I told him to leave. 
and he said that didn't mean we were breaking up. I cried myself to sleep that night, realizing I was being irrational hangry much, I apologized, explaining that hunger made me me act that way. But Alex was hurt and upset, and after a heated text exchange, he left and blocked me. His Discord friends tried to mediate, but he was firm and cut off contact. I went back to the summer house, and the stress gave me panic attacks and made me physically ill. Three weeks later, Alex reached out, saying he hated our relationship and felt he didn't deserve me. Despite arguing, we apologized and decided to give it another shot. Around this time, my dad had a serious accident, which brought us closer. We met up, had a good time, and talked about our issues. Alex admitted he'd made a pact with a girl named Emma, someone he'd tried to date before but was turned down. I was suspicious, but he insisted they were just friends. During those three weeks apart, I'd lost some weight and gained some self-love. In October 2021, we dressed up for Halloween, and Alex posted a sweet picture of me on his Instagram. In December, we went ice skating for the first time and visited a Christmas market, which he loved. In February, he asked me to go to prom with him, which I happily accepted since my school didn't have one. He told me his mom had said, I'm so happy you're with her. She makes you better and happier. I really like her, which meant a lot to me. But on Valentine's Day 2022, we had a stupid fight, and two days later, he left again. I hoped it was just a break since he hadn't blocked me. But when I reached out to support him after a rough night, he responded harshly and blocked me. I tried reaching out multiple times, but nothing. After three months, our friend Jake suggested Alex might not come back, which sent me spiraling into depression and suicidal thoughts. I'd struggled with depression and eating disorders since I was 12, and Alex knew this. After the breakup, I fell behind in school, lost friends, and didn't pass my exams. During the summer, I kept struggling while Alex went to the army. It hurt even more when I found out through pictures that he took Emma to prom. In May, he posted a song on YouTube dissing me and our relationship. At the end of summer, a friend showed me a picture of a girl wearing what looked like Alex's hoodie, hinting he had a new girlfriend. I contacted Alex, who claimed he was doing great since the breakup. Despite the harsh exchange, it pushed me to focus on myself. By New Year's, I'd become happier, healthier, and more mature, a shining light, as some people said. I made a new friend named Max, who's still important to me. Just before New Year's, Alex unblocked me but didn't say anything. Then, the day before, he reached out, wanting to talk. Despite my anxiety, I agreed. In a 30-minute call, he admitted he broke up due to stress and felt he didn't deserve me. He acknowledged mistreating me and lying about being happy after the breakup. After the call and a few texts, he blocked me again, leaving me feeling shattered. But I took it as a lesson and kept healing, focusing on school. In January, I saw his profile on a dating app, but didn't interact. The day before Valentine's Day 2023, he added me again. He claimed it was an accident, but we ended up talking. It felt like we'd never been apart. He mentioned how much better I seem now, probably because I'd spent the last year healing and learning to love myself. After getting back together, I found out that while we were apart, He'd seen multiple women but hadn't slept with any. That hurt because I hadn't been with anyone else I felt like it would be cheating, even though we were broken up. He started blaming me for turning Jake against him and for messages my mom had supposedly sent him, which I knew nothing about. He yelled at me, I cried. He eventually apologized, but nothing really got resolved. Not wanting to lose him again, I swallowed my feelings and let it go. One day, after being intimate, he got on one knee, just admiring me in silence. Another time, he called me wifey but played it off when I reacted. We used to fall asleep on calls but decided to stop that. One night, he fell asleep on a call, and after I wished him sweet dreams and hung up, he called back multiple times. I ended up sleeping on the call with him. The next morning, he asked about it, and when I explained, he cried and thanked me I wasn't sure why. In early March, while he was away with the army, I expressed concern about his old hip injury. He got super angry, yelled at me, called me names, and blocked me, despite my attempts to calm things down. That evening, I broke down and talked to my sister's husband. He told me I'd handled it maturely and that Alex was being immature and disrespectful. At the end of March, I had my first exam and was nervous. That night, Alex unblocked me and asked about it. I insisted he apologize for his previous outburst, and after he reluctantly did, we got back together. We went for a drive, and I opened up about everything that had happened. He cried and whispered, I'm so glad you're here, and you'll always own a special part of my heart, but then, things got weird. He started role-playing, holding my wrists tightly and putting me in uncomfortable positions. I told him to stop, that he was hurting me but he didn't let go for what felt like 20 minutes. When he finally realized I was in pain, he let go and started self-sabotaging. I ended up consoling him. My wrists hurt for days, but I didn't tell him to avoid making him depressed. One day, he took me out to try new foods, taught me some driving, and we watched a beautiful sunset. He took me to his family's land, saying I was the first person he'd brought there besides family. Later, he asked for intimacy, but I declined, saying I felt used. We ended up having a playful conversation and a steamy makeout session. He talked about past relationships, calling his exes crazy in early May. Things went downhill again. He became distant. And after a conversation, he said he'd fallen in love with me again but wanted to be free and enjoy being young. We had a call where he cited trivial reasons for breaking up. I tried to accept it gracefully but ended up pleading with him. He lashed out and blocked me again. I confided in my sister, and they advised me to let him go. Over the summer, I tried to focus on myself but my school performance suffered, and I lost friends. Alex finished his army service and joined a university near my home. I found out he'd slept with someone during a festival. It felt like cheating. Even though we were broken up, I'm struggling to heal from all this. Part of me hates him for what he's done, but another part believes he can mature and that we could be happy together. I don't know how to move on or if he could ever change.
My husband blamed me for our stillborn son and rejected our triplet daughters. Now I'm diversing him to product my children. I 27 female have been with my husband 29 male for five years, married for three of those years. Our marriage was perfect and we were so happy. It felt like our entire life was perfect church on Sunday, loving husband, beautiful home, all of it. A few months into our marriage, I became pregnant and my husband and I were overjoyed. And so was the rest of our family. My husband was especially happy after finding out our baby was a boy as he'd always told me he wanted at least one son. I even started to try to repair my relationship with my mother so our son could have a relationship with his grandparents. I had originally cut off most contact with my mother due to how she treated my brother when he married his husband. Though my brother said he was all right with my decision to try to get her back in my life since he still has love for her, and my baby was her first grandchild. However, our son ended up stillborn, and it broke me. I fell into a depression and even at one point considered taking my life, but my husband was there for me during all of it, and we got through the grief. Our marriage felt stronger than ever, and life started slowly feeling beautiful again, even if it no longer felt perfect. About five months ago, I found out I'm pregnant again and then found out soon after that we're having triplets. My husband and I were over the moon and he was the most doting and loving husband. Since we had always said we wanted two to three children, we agreed we wouldn't try for any more children after this. Because of our and our family's excitement for the triplets, we decided to throw a baby shower and gender reveal party. We trusted my brother with the genders of the triplets and he bought some confetti cannons with the colored streamers inside. The baby shower went wonderfully with my parents, in-laws, my brother and his husband and their daughter, and tons of friends and extended family. It was like a dream come true, and I was so excited for the gender reveal. I don't care what the gender of our babies was, I just wanted healthy little babies, but my husband was clearly excited for potentially three sons. When the time came, me, my husband, and my brother all shot a confetti cannon, and all three shot out pink confetti. I was so excited, and so was my brother, but my husband screamed at the top of his lungs and hit the table in front of us, hitting it so hard that it actually broke. He screamed at me that I was supposed to give him at least one son because I killed his first one. That's when I burst into tears. I had been so broken up about our son's stillbirth, and a part of me had felt it was my fault. And now my husband, the love of my life, was telling me that it was. My brother immediately stepped in and tried to get my husband to calm down, but my husband shoved my brother. So my brother instead pulled me inside where I cried in the living room while my husband's mother tried to calm him down. I could hear him screaming outside about how three daughters are too many, how he doesn't want four kids, but he also wants a son. Ever since that moment, my husband has hardly talked to me. He's been sleeping in the guest room, and when we do interact, he's clearly upset and mad and tries to argue with me. I tried to talk to him about it and asked about how he'll be with our three daughters. But he spat at me and told me he will provide them shelter and food. But he isn't interested in daughters and doesn't plan to have a close relationship with them. That sealed the deal that I want to divorce him, and I cried myself to sleep last night. Earlier today, I confided in my mother and mother-in-law about all this, but they told me I can't divorce my husband just because he wants a son. I don't want my daughters to grow up in an unloving household where their parents constantly argue and their father doesn't love them. The moment my husband said I killed our son, I felt as though I lost all love I had for him in an instant, and I don't want my daughters to be in that kind of household. However, both my mom and mother-in-law say it's just natural for men to want sons and that at least he isn't saying he'll mistreat them. They treated this as absolute fact and acted as though I'm just a silly little girl who doesn't know anything. I felt incredibly small and stupid. I don't know what to do. My mother and mother-in-law make me feel like maybe I'm overreacting to my husband's behavior. But my brother says this is not normal as he and his husband are both men who absolutely love their daughter. I'm also not sure of what I'll do with myself if I divorce my husband. I don't work, and I'm not sure how I'll be able to find a job that can support me and three babies all on my own or how I'll make time for all of them when I have to work. I feel so lost and helpless. I'm torn on what to do because I worry divorce will be too brash of a decision and that maybe my mother and mother-in-law are right. From the comments, first, stop sharing your feelings on this and your plans on this with your mother-in-law and mother. They made you feel like you are wrong. This guy says he isn't going to care for them right. He blamed you for a stillborn baby and has spat on you. You can't stay with this guy. If you get pregnant again, no guarantee it would be a boy with then. He meant everything he said because he still isn't talking to you. Think about it. He spat on you like you are a piece of trash over something you have no control of. Chew on that for a bit. Stop talking and listening to them. You cannot stay with him. You have to know that. Update. I didn't expect to have an update so soon. But after reading everyone's comments, I decided to take action immediately and went to my brother's house. 
We talked for hours through the night and came up with a plan. I am going to divorce my husband. He's shown the kind of man he is, and I don't want to live in or raise daughters in that kind of environment. I'm going to move in with my brother and brother-in-law during all this. He and his husband have a nice, large house where I can have my own room and a nursery for the triplets. I originally worried that perhaps myself and three babies would be overwhelming or a burden to him and my brother-in-law, but they assured me they would love to have us here. I knew everything would be okay when my brother even offered to have a baby monitor put in their bedroom so he could help if more than one of the triplets woke up during the night. My brother-in-law has a nice, high-paying job and my brother works from home, so I will have a stable environment and my brother will help with his nieces. My own niece is excited for us to live with her. The current plan is I will live with my brother and brother-in-law for a while, and once my babies are old enough where I feel comfortable putting them in daycare, which my brother-in-law has offered to pay for, then I can try to find a job of my own where I can save up money and eventually move into a nice place of my own with my daughters. I'm so thankful for my brother and brother-in-law. They truly feel like angels. My brother and I are also going to go no contact with my mother. My brother and I discussed her behavior with us growing up, how she treated him when he came out and also got married, and how she's treated me these past few days. We decided this was the best course of action, as we've given her many chances in our lives to become more stable and kind, but she's always refused them. And we want our daughters to grow up in a loving family. When I knew my husband had left for church this morning, my brother-brother-in-law, and I went to my house and got all my important things, such as documents, clothes, and things that are special to me, as well as all the baby things. My brother-in-law's mother watched my niece while we did all this. She is a kind woman and has offered to be a grandmother to my own babies, which I happily accepted. I will admit that I cried. I've cried a lot lately, but mostly happy tears because my brother and I didn't go to church. My ladies' Bible study group texted me and asked if we were all right and if we needed anything. I texted them back and told them the truth and what happened and they were all horrified. They told me they support me and are proud of me for taking action and are now even planning a bake sale at the church to help raise money for me and my babies. Also, apparently, when my husband went out to lunch after church with his men's Bible group, one of the other members is husband to one of my friends in my Bible group. And when he found out what happened, he yelled at my husband so much that he cried. I got a little bit of joy out of hearing about that, not going to lie. My pastor even called me and asked if I'm okay, and he let me know that I'll always have people who support me at my church, which I'm very grateful for. After my husband came home from church and saw that most of my stuff was gone, he blew up my phone. But my brother-in-law called him for me and said that he would pay for my husband to get therapy for his grief over our son and also told him to leave me alone. My husband has not tried to contact me since, and he has yet to give my brother-in-law an answer for his therapy offer. All in all, I'm so grateful for my brother and brother-in-law. I wouldn't be able to do any of this without them. I'm hopeful for the future, and while this isn't the kind of future I imagined for myself or my babies, this is definitely the best one I can currently give them. They say it takes a village, and my babies will definitely have a village full of love, love, and support. Thank you and bless you to everyone who left comments supporting me. I'm grateful for all of them and I'm glad I could give you a very speedy and happy update. From the comments, I am so happy you have a strong support group. You are doing what's best for you and your girls, giving them a happy, safe life with people who care about them. Do not let your soon-to-be ex gaslight you into going back to him. He has shown you who he really is, and you need to remember that. His cruel words about your son are unforgivable. Best of luck. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.